Good afternoon. My name is Brian Cuevas. I'm a professor here in the Religion Department. And uh, it's an enormous pleasure to welcome you today to our annual Tessa J. Bartholomew's Lecture Series, uh, which this year I'm happy to announce we're actually having two uh, in this series. Um, now, I want to say something briefly about Tessa. Tessa was a our late friend and colleague, Tess Bartholomew, was an eminent scholar of Buddhism in South Asia, specifically Sri Lanka. And every year, we hold this series uh, inviting an eminent scholar in Asian studies to uh, honor her memory. And uh, so we continue to do that today. This one, I believe, is our 15th annual Bartholomew's lecture. Now, the lectures, the lecture today and, to, and tomorrow is also part of uh, the Department of Religion's 50th anniversary celebration. We've been celebrating this all year with wonderful talks, and this is the finale of our 50th anniversary celebration, today and tomorrow. Excuse me. And in the, self, in the spirit of celebration, we are delighted to have with us today and tomorrow, more on this in a moment, Professor Donald S. Lopez. And it's with great pleasure and honor uh, to welcome Professor Lopez to FSU and to Tallahassee. Donald Lopez is the Arthur E. Link Distinguished University Professor of Buddhist and Tibetan Studies in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He received his PhD from the University of Virginia in 1982 under the tutelage of Professor Jeffrey Hawkins, who it so happens was my advisor as well. Several years later, uh, our friend and colleague Tessa Bartholomews was also a graduate of the University of Virginia and a number of our faculty currently here in the department are graduates of UVA. So I also think of this as somewhat of a celebration of the UVA uh, contingent. <laughs> Professor Lopez is a true giant in the field of Buddhist studies and an extremely prolific writer, publishing what seems to be three or four books a year. He is, I think, like the Stephen King of Buddhist studies. <laughs> it's amazing. Published so much that, of course, I'm not going to go over all of the books that he's published. He's been the recipient of numerous prestigious awards and honors, including election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2000, fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Templeton Foundation, and by my count, six NEH fellowships, among many other honors. He is a scholar of remarkable breadth and reach, one of the few, if not the only, scholar in our relatively narrow field whose works are read outside our field in the world, out, you know, the real world, right? <laughs> This is an impressive achievement and something that I would, uh, could only hope of, uh, dream of achieving. He's published widely on themes of broader interest in religious studies, post-colonial studies, Orientalism, religion and science, and so much more. Professor Lopez is perhaps most renowned for his pioneering scholarship engaged in the critical assessment of American and European interpretations of Buddhism and Tibet, past and present, and the construction and deconstruction of the category of modern or modernist Buddhism in the West. His criticisms are often pointed, sometimes even controversial, but always good humored, as I'm sure you'll see today. One of his most recognized books in this regard is his award-winning Prisoners of Shangri-La, 
Tibetan Buddhism in the West, which was published in 1998 uh, with Chicago. Uh, I, I understand now that the 20th anniversary edition of this classic work is in the works. This was a book that was the focus of one of the most heated and entertaining AAR panels in recent memory. This was in Boston in 1999, uh, infamous event. The uh, papers of that panel were gathered together and published in a special issue of the Journal of the American Academy of Religion. I believe that too is in 1999. Professor Lopez is the author of countless other monographs and edited volumes, and each one has shaped the field in momentous ways. I mentioned just a few recent offerings. We have Buddhism and Science, a Guide for the Perplexed, 2011. The Scientific Buddha, His Short and Happy Life, 2012. From Stone to Flesh, A Short History of the Buddha, 2013. In Search of the Christian Buddha, with Peggy McCracken, that's 2014. And his most recent colossal reference work, the Princeton Dictionary of Buddhism with Robert Buswell at UCLA, that also was in 2014. Among his numerous and exceptional edited works, I wish to note here his two groundbreaking scholarly anthologies, which ushered in a paradigm shift in our field. In 1988, there was Buddhist hermeneutics published by the University of Hawaii Press. And then, in 1995, Curators of the Buddha, the Study of Buddhism under Colonialism. He has also edited the award-winning Buddhist scriptures from, for Penguin Classics, Chicago's Critical Terms for the Study of Buddhism, and recently, the Buddhism volume in the acclaimed Norton Anthology of World Religions. This is an absolutely stunning array of important scholarly contributions, and I could continue giving you titles, but I will uh, refrain from, from that today, particularly since we had trouble getting in, in the doors. Um, now, these days, uh, Professor Lopez has been turning his skilled eye on the remarkable Tibetan language writings of the 18th century Italian Jesuit missionary to Tibet, Ippolito Desideri. Some aspects of this work he will be sharing with us tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, at the second Bartholomew's lecture, which is in this room at 5 o'clock. But now, on to today's lecture. The lecture today is entitled, Dispatches from Nirvana. 45 years of Buddhist studies. Please join me in welcoming Professor Donald Lopez. Thank you very much, Brian. It's a great honor to be invited to participate in the celebrations of the 50th anniversary of this renowned department. That honor is only slightly diminished by the recognition that your invitation to speak today is more a function of my longevity than my eminence. <laughs> my vanity, therefore, has compelled me to entitle my comments 45 years of Buddhist studies rather than 50, because in 1965, the year of the department's founding, I was a mere lad of 13. I had no connection to the field of Buddhist studies or even an idea of what the term might mean. I did, however, have a connection to this place, which perhaps makes my presence here appropriate, despite being far too young for the job. My mother's family is from Panama City, and every year during my youth, we would drive across the country, first from Ohio, then California, then Colorado, and then later from Virginia to spend two weeks there. My uncle, whose name was Dempsey Barron, was the long-serving Democratic state senator from Bay County, eventually being elected president of Florida Senate in 1975. So in the summer of 1965, I was certainly in the panhandle, and there's a good chance I was in Tallahassee 
I brought two cousins uh, to testify to that fact. <laughs> As I think back to what we used to do every summer, I recall that the miniature golf course on Panama City Beach had a hole in which you had to put the ball into the opening of the hands of a crudely made concrete Buddha. It was many years later that I learned that this gesture was called the Jnana Mudra. So I was unsure how to structure my comments this afternoon. 50 years or even 45 years is a lot to cover in 50 minutes. And for people outside the field of Buddhist studies, and even for those inside it, the recitation of the titles of books and the names of scholars is not particularly interesting. In the end, I decided to talk about what I know best, myself. <laughs> I'm not sure how representative my career has been, but I have been present either as a participant or an observer at the various changes that the field of Buddhist studies has undergone over the past half century. I offer these comments not to set myself up as any kind of model. The story I tell might be better seen as a cautionary tale. The story is certainly strange. I hope that it's also mildly diverting. I will have recourse to mention some of my publications, but I'm going to focus for the most part on my editorial work, that is, my efforts to contribute to the field more broadly in cooperation with other scholars. So, a native of Virginia, I enrolled in what we reverentially call Mr. Jefferson's University in the fall of 1970. I received a five on the AP exams in history, English, and Spanish, and went to college assuming that I would major in one of those fields. But it was 1970, the Vietnam War was raging, Nixon was president, and the previous May had left four dead in Ohio. There was a general sense among my friends that Western civilization was entirely corrupt, that if salvation was to be found, it would be, it would be discovered in the East, in what we still called Oriental philosophy and Eastern mysticism. Richard Alpert's Be Here Now, which cost $3.33, with each three written like an ohm, came out in 1971. In the second semester of my freshman year, I took a course on Gandhi. In my sophomore year, I took a course called Chinese Intellectual History to 618 AD. It was taught by a student of W.T. de Berry, someone who worked on Ming Neo-Confucianism and likely disapproved of Buddhism. I only remember one thing from the course, it was when he wrote a long and unpronounceable word on the blackboard, one that I butchered when I tried to ask a question about it. The word was bodhisattva. I don't remember what he said about it. All I remember is the feeling of frisson when I heard the word. Many years later, I learned that horripiliation is a common occurrence in Buddhist sutras. I would end up taking all the classes on Asian religion offered at Virginia, both of them, uh, becoming a religion major. In the spring of my junior year, the department conducted a search for a specialist in Buddhism and hired someone called Jeffrey Hopkins. Hopkins had an unusual history, having studied for years with various Tibetan lamas living in exile in the US and in India before receiving a PhD from Wisconsin. The story of the Buddhist studies program that he founded could be the topic of an entire lecture. I will note here only that the general principle which all of us accepted without question was that the Tibetan Buddhist tradition contained timeless truths, that much Western scholarship on Buddhism was mistaken, and that our task was to learn how to translate Tibetan texts into English with a rigorous consistency of terminology. Our own analysis of those texts was of little or no importance since we, unlike the authors that we studied, were benighted beings. In 1978, I received a Fulbright Fellowship to study in India, spending a year with Tibetan refugees, mostly in a monastery in the South. Years later, I would write an essay about that time called Foreigner at the Lama's Feet, an essay, an essay invariably described by my fellow Tibetologists as brutally honest. I returned to the States in 1979, just in time to organize the visit of the Dalai Lama to Charlottesville one of the stops on his first visit to the US. Again, this is the subject of another lecture. Back then, when the Dalai Lama needed to go somewhere, we got in a Dodge with me driving and took off. <laughs> 
In April 1980, Jeffrey Hopkins received a, a call from Middlebury College in Vermont saying they were looking for a leave replacement. He rec recommended me, a 27-year-old ABD. I would become one of four members of the Department of Religion. There was the college chaplain who taught Old Testament and New Testament. There was a New, New England church historian who'd written a book about Jonathan Edwards the Younger. There was a scholar of modern religious thought writing a book about Dewey, and there was me. It was a 3-3 load in which I taught my own discussion sections for lectures that eventually drew over 100 students. In the meantime, I was trying to finish a dissertation on a defunct school of medieval Indian Buddhism whose name I did not even bother mentioning to anyone in Vermont. Thus, in 1980, at one of the better liberal arts colleges in the country, the Department of Religion felt it perfectly adequate to have three people who worked on various elements of Christianity, mostly American Christianity, and me. My job, therefore, was not in Buddhist studies. It was in none of the above. I was expected to teach and did teach courses in all forms of Buddhism, on Hinduism, Confucianism, Taoism, and Islam. Although I was utterly unqualified to teach any of them, having come straight from graduate school with a deep but narrow training in a particular form of Tibetan Buddhist scholasticism. How I survived is yet another tale for another occasion. I remember sitting at a faculty lunch in which an older professor, he must have been at least 50, went around the table and asked each of us to name the big question in our field. He was a geologist and plate tectonics was a hot topic at the time. When it was my turn to name the big question in my field, I said, does God exist? <laughs> the person I was replacing at Middlebury never returned, and I was given the tenure track job. By now, I had completed my dissertation on that forgotten school of Indian Buddhist philosophy. Unable to find a publisher, on the advice of Jeffrey Hopkins, I submitted it to a new Dharma press called Snow Lion. And through a very strange set of circumstances, I was granted tenure almost immediately, becoming an associate professor when I was 31, a full professor when I was 36. During my time at Middlebury, I received an NEH grant to organize a conference on Buddhist hermeneutics. This was 1984, and hermeneutics was all the rage, with everyone reading Gadamer, or at least David Tracy's version of Gadamer. <laughs> Buddhist studies was still a rel relatively small field at the time, and the topic of the conference in many ways provides some sense of how many of us, outside those employed at the handful of graduate programs in Buddhist studies, had to represent ourselves. Identifying traditional topics in Judaism and especially Christianity and saying, look, Buddhists have scriptures too. Not only do, do they have scriptures, they have methods for interpreting them. They have hermeneutics. Middlebury was a wonderful place to learn how to teach, the students were excellent, the faculty were committed teachers, but it was small. At the time, a school of 1,800 students and 150 faculty in a Vermont village of 7,000. We all had to go to graduation each year and sit on the stage in our caps and gowns. It was so boring that I began running, running a betting pool on whether the commencement speaker would quote Mark Twain. <laughs> I always bet that they would, and I always won. <laughs> After I received tenure, I noticed that some of my senior colleagues had turned away from active scholarship <clears throat> and were devoting much of their time to snowshoeing and beekeeping. Fearing such a fate, in 1989, I applied for and was offered a position at the University of Michigan. Here, I was no longer Mr. None of the Above, but one of three Buddhologists. <clears throat> and yet, I was still haunted by the experience of having to teach everything. Over the years at Middlebury, I had come to regard, <clears throat> excuse me, the standard anthologies that we had to use with a certain suspicion. It had become increasingly necessary to teach against rather than with the textbooks and anthologies I assigned, resorting eventually, as did so many others in those days, to the course pack, a makeshift, makeshift anthology of photocopied selections from a number of different sources. That seemed to work for a while but the materials available for photocopying were often limited. In a moment of high desperation and low lucidity, it occurred to me that each generation produces its own set of anthologies 
and no one had been foolish enough to attempt such a thing since the Barry and his Sources series from Columbia in the 60s. During that time, a new generation of translators, my fellow undergraduates of the 60s and the 70s, who had set out seeking enlightenment and ended up with a PhD, had been trained in the languages and histories of Asia and were now producing their own translations. In 1991, I therefore somehow convinced Princeton University Press to agree to the creation of something called Princeton Readings in Religions, a new set of series of anthologies. Today, there are 17 volumes in print. One of the principles that motivated the selection of texts for the Princeton series was that the series should not necessarily focus on classic texts, the classic texts of the Asian cultures. It had long been clear that the ill-defined Western canon of Asian religious texts required interrogation. Such a rereading of this canon did not imply that its constituents are somehow not important or are merely the products of an Orientalist past we have long since escaped. The reason for not including the classics was largely practical. Many of these works continued to be available in inexpensive paperback editions. Some, most notably the Tao Te Ching, appears in a new translation every year. To place such famous works in the new anthologies would necessarily displace lesser known works. By keeping the inclusion of such works to a minimum, however, I also wish to call into question the notion of the classic. To the extent that Asian cultures have canons, the works that constitute those canons could be regarded as classics. Scores of works have remained obscure from the Western gaze, either because they lack the official sanction of the male elites of a given institution, or they've remained hidden in a particular collection of texts so large to have generally eluded scholarly discovery. Furthermore, in some cases, the identification of this or that work as a classic of an Asian religion has as much to do with the brief history of its study and reception in the West as it does with its influence in its own culture. The very notion of a classical period, although certainly also present in China, is in many ways the product of the quest for the origins and the attendant historicism of much 19th century European scholarship in which histories of Asian civilizations were written that identified their origins, their classical periods, and their decline. The last of these, also called the modern period, was marked by decay and impotence and inevitably occurred contemporaneous with and hence was used to justify European colonialism. In planning the Princeton series, the question soon arose as to whether any of the classics should be included in any of the volumes. In an email conversation with a friend, he asked, how can you have an anthology on Chinese religions without Zhuangzi's butterfly dream? He was referring to one of the most quoted passages in Chinese literature. Once, Zhuangzi thought he was a butterfly, a butterfly flitting and fluttering around, happy with himself, and doing as he pleased. He did not know that he was Zhuangzi. Suddenly he woke up and there he was, solid and unmistakably Zhuangzi. But he didn't know if he was Zhuangzi who dreamt he was a butterfly, or a butterfly dreaming he was Zhuangzi. Between Zhuangzi and a butterfly, there must be some dis distinction. This became a vexing question for me, at first akin to Wittgenstein's, can one play chess without the queen? That is, is an anthology of Chinese texts that would be, we would call religious really an anthology without the butterfly dream? Can you have an anthology on the religions of India without the Bhagavad Gita? This question became my koan, my Zen puzzle designed to break through the walls of logic and deliver me into editorial enlightenment. It haunted me night and day, beads of sweat forming on my brow as I poured through all the old collections each of which contained these very works. The breakthrough occurred suddenly one day when I discovered a work by Madame Blavatsky, somehow included in a compilation of Buddhist scriptures, Christmas Humphrey's 1960, The Wisdom of Buddhism. In Humphrey's anthology, there were only five works on Tibet. One was actually Indian, but the last and longest was an extended extract from The Voice of the Silence by the Russian founder of the Theosophical Society a work which she claimed came from a manuscript in the secret Senzar language, what which scholars regarded as her own fabrication. <laughs> the inclusion of Blavatsky's work in the anthology on Buddhism raises a host of issues about criteria for authenticity and the persistent mystification of Asia 
but it answered my question on, of whether you can have an anthology on Chinese religions without Guangzhou's butterfly dream. The answer was yes. The apparition of Madame Blavatsky suggested that any text, no matter how bizarre, could be included in an anthology on Asian religions, then no particular text, no matter how classical, had to be included. I decided that in making these anthologies, I would begin with the assumption that no single work necessarily had to be there. <clears throat> with the classics at least theoretically excluded, the more difficult task became how to decide which works to include. For each of the proposed volumes on India, China, Buddhism, Japan, and Tibet, there were thousands of untranslated works available, all manner of ritual texts, hagiographies, folk tales, and ethnographic sources. To identify which works needed to be included and then to commission their translation seemed both ideologically problematic and logistically impossible. It was ideologically problematic because for me to pre-select the works that should appear in a new anthology of the religions of India, for example, would imply some kind of omniscience, the same kind of control of representation that previous anthologizers had so often blithely displayed. It was logistically impossible because I knew well that scholars rather stubbornly work on what they're working on. And they will rarely undertake a new project, such as translating an unfamiliar text, except in exchange for large sums of money. <laughs> Instead, I decided to try to exploit the unavoidably random nature of anthologies by employing a modified call for papers approach, contacting a group of scholars, and especially younger scholars, whose work was highly regarded, and asking them what they had available on their hard drives either from their dissertations or from their current research, asking in particular for works that had not been translated before. The contents of the volume were therefore determined largely by what was submitted. The implications of such an approach is that the canon is the aggregate of what scholars are studying, teaching, and in this case, translating at a given moment. For religions of Indian practice, for example, I wrote to 57 scholars, receiving responses from 45, the translations of 30 of those scholars appear in the book. Thus, even this random approach had, like all anthologies, its own criteria for selection, for inclusion, and exclusion. I chose, scholars whom I, invited, I chose the scholars whom I invited to participate in the project. They chose to contribute or chose not to, and I chose works for inclusion from those they had submitted. No one submitted, nor would I have included a translation from the Gita. This apparently random approach to assembling the contents of the book could also have been extended to the next task, the organization of the contents, because the task of the anthologizer is not simply one of selection, but also of narration. It is not, it is not only in the selection of text, but in their organization that the violence of anthologizing becomes evident. To anthologize is to extract a text from its context. If it is, it, if it, is, if it is an extract from a larger work, it, it is fragmented from its place as a part of, of an apparent whole. But even if the work is translated in its entirety, there is the inevitable decontextualization entailed by the very act of translation, with this necessary sacrifice of much of the aesthetics of its expression. There's all, as well the removal of the text from the site of its production, from the ritual of which it is often a part, from the diction of its recitation, to anthologize is to isolate the text from the social histories of its author and its audiences, to efface the materialities of the text production to create the flatness of the printed page. All of this is to suggest that religions of Indian practice and the other volumes in the series are not intended to be somehow comprehensive or inclusive or even representative of the diversity of something called, for example, the Indian religious tradition. All of these terms suggest notions of a completeness and closure of a tradition that is in many ways our own fantasy. The task of the anthologizer in this age then is not to create a new canon, which can then be lauded or commended as balanced or incomplete, lacking this or that essential text. It would be naive to imagine, however, that with the publication of a new set of anthologies, a new kind of canon is not also being created somehow. A counter canon is also a canon and comes into being as such at the moment of its publication. And it would be equally naive to imagine that unlike the anthologies of the past, the assembling of a new anthology is not a generational task that, is, that in, in its own way reflects the zeitgeist. In my case, seeking to include the less authoritative voices that have been previously excluded or actively silenced 
the voices of women and of various minority groups within Asian societies. Stated in the most simple terms, the task of the anthologizer is to gather the work that is being done at the moment. For the anthologizer of the 19th century, both European and Asian, an era of the strange marriage of philology and colonialism, there was something to be gained from the portrayal of an East, either timeless, of, the, of the East as either timeless or static, depending on one's agenda, ever, ever introverted toward the spiritual. But there is no agenda-less anthology and it may be necessary to wait the judgment of another generation to, ident to identify the agenda of the present day anthologizer beyond the attempt to problematize previous representations of Asia by gathering together the works of scholars who broaden the range of texts available to us from India or China or Japan or Tibet, remembering that such an us increasingly includes students and colleagues of Asian heritage that is an us that, that often until quite recently was them. At the same time then, the task of the anthologizer should also be to provide a means for reflection on the historical processes by which cultures, both our own and those of others, are constructed, providing in the process the means for reflecting on how and why such pronouns of possession are employed. Last month I received a request, as if my per permission was required, for a session at the AAR on the impact of religions of China in practice 20 years after its publication. Also in 1991, I organized a panel at the AAR on the topic of Buddhism and Orientalism. As far as I know, this was the first sustained encounter of scholars of Buddhism with Edward Said's famous book, a mere 13 years after it had been published. Yet even with this long delay, the panel was controversial. During the question and answer period, the distinguished Sinologist Rob Jumello asked, quote, now that this self-flagellation session is over, can we all get back to work? <laughs> the papers presented at that panel became the basis for an edited volume called Curators of the Buddha, the study of Buddhism under colonialism. Many of our colleagues happily did go back to work, but the conversation provoked by that book would open new avenues for the work of others. When I was in graduate school, no one worked on the so-called modern period. It was really only in the last two decades that what has come to be called modern Buddhism has come to gain legitimacy in the academy, but only with difficulty. As recently as 2000, which I suppose was not that recently, uh, I submitted a manuscript uh, called Buddhist Scriptures to Penguin, a work that I had been invited to produce, not because Edward Collins' 1959 work of the same title was woefully outdated, but because it had fallen beneath a certain sales plateau. The manuscript I submitted included selection from Anagatika Dharmapala and D.T. Suzuki. I received a letter from the press uh, reminding me that the book would be part of the Penguin Classics series and as such should not include work from the 19th or 20th century. I therefore removed those selections and produced another anthology called A Modern Buddhist Bible published by Beacon Press with the title and publisher an homage to Dwight Goddard's very influential and very eccentric work from 1932. Today, thankfully, we have many scholars working on the modern period by which we tend to mean the 19th to 20th centuries. They're finding jobs, their work is being published, and their books are winning awards. It's an, it is important work. Buddhist studies is no longer the exclusive domain of antiquarians. Let me mention one other collaborative work uh, worth mentioning because it represents well the progress that's been made in Buddhist studies over the past 50 years. I'm referring to the Princeton Dictionary of Buddhism published in 2014. One of the great achievements of 20th century Buddhology was the Bukyo Daijiten, the Encyclopedia of Buddhism by, uh, published in 10 massive volumes between 1932 and 1964 by the distinguished Japanese scholar Mochizuki Shinko. Among English language works, uh, there is William Soothill's Dictionary of Chinese Buddhist Terms published in 1937, and from the same year, G.P. Malalasekara's invaluable Dictionary of Pali Proper Names. Apart from the remarkable learning that these earlier works display, two things are noteworthy about them. The first is that they're principally based on a single source language or a single Buddhist tradition. The second is that they are all at least a half century old. Many things have changed in the field of Buddhist studies, obviously over the past 50 years, some for the worse, some very much for the better. We look back in awe at figures like Louis de Lavallee-Poussin and his student, Monsignor Etienne Lamotte, 
who were able to use sources in Sanskrit, Pali, Chinese, Japanese, and Tibetan with a high level of skill. Today, few scholars have the luxury of time to develop such expertise. Yet this change is not necessarily a sign of the decline of the Dharma predicted by the Buddha. From several perspectives, we're now in the golden age of Buddhist studies. A century ago, scholarship on Buddhism focused on the classical texts of India and to a much lesser extent, China. Tibetan and Chinese sources were valued largely for the access they provided to Indian texts lost in the original Sanskrit. The Buddhism of Korea was seen as an appendage to the Buddhism of China or as a largely unacknowledged source of the Buddhism of Japan. Beyond the works of the so-called Pali Canon, relatively little was known of the practice of Buddhism in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. All of this has changed for the better over the past half century. There are now many more scholars of Buddhism, there is a much higher level of specialization, and there's a larger body of important scholarship on each of the many Buddhist cultures of Asia. In addition, the number of adherents of Buddhism in the West has grown significantly with many developing an extensive knowledge of a particular Buddhist tradition, whether or not they hold the academic credentials of a professional Buddhologist. Robert Buswell and I then had the good fortune to be able to draw upon this expanding body of scholarship in preparing the dictionary. It's based primarily on six Buddhist languages and their traditions, Sanskrit, Pali, Tibetan, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, but also included our terms and proper names in Burmese, Lao, Mongolian, Sinhalese, Thai, and Vietnamese. One of the reviews of the book said, quote, this is a one-of-a-kind reference book that will not be replicated in this generation's lifetime. Because I care about my colleague's sanity, I hope that this is correct. It was not an easy book to write. In fact, it, it concluded with a month in prison in Los Angeles. Uh, my cellmate was Robert Buswell. Uh, we were forced to correct the page proofs of the Princeton Dictionary of Buddhism, staring at dozens of diacritical marks, transliterated terms and Chinese characters among the 1.2 million words on each of the book's 1,264 tiny print pages, 18 hours a day, seven days a week. Each day at 5 p.m., the prison guards, who were ourselves, uh, allowed us 30 minutes of exercise, uh, walk along the dusty paths of Topanga Canyon, always watching for rattlesnakes. In those rare moments in which we were able to speak, unimpeded by the facial tics we both developed, uh, we talked about what we'd been learning. With the expansion of our studies into historical periods, into geographical regions, and into languages that were not previously known, over the past 30 years or so, a number of scholars have argued that it is more accurate to refer to what we study as Buddhisms in the plural, rather than Buddhism, singular. However, that expansion of our knowledge can also lead to the opposite conclusion. And Robert and I both decided independently that the doctrines, the practices, the institutions, and the obsessions found across the dynasties, across the regions, across the languages, justify the use of the term Buddhism in the singular. We were struck by two other th themes as we surveyed those pages. The first was that despite being a community of beggars, and beggar is the meaning of the term bhikshu in Sanskrit that we mistranslate as monk. Uh, despite being a community of beggars, the Buddha Sangha over the course of its long history and vast geographical ex expanse has been the recipients of vast amounts of wealth. We were also struck by the pervasive importance in Buddhism of what, for want of a better term, we might call magic. So, 50 years later, we know so much more and yet there is so much that we don't know. Just in the case of Indian Buddhism, three huge questions haunt us. The first is, when was the Buddha born and when did he die? With scholars in biblical studies writing learned articles to debate the birth of Jesus in a range between six and four BCE, scholars of Buddhism have dismissed many traditional dates as wildly inaccurate, but continue to debate death dates almost a century apart, with a consensus roughly ranging at 400 BCE, plus or minus 20. Everyone assumes that the Buddha lived for 80 years because one text says so. The second question that we ponder is when and why what we call the Mahayana began. In a culture and a tradition that places such emphasis on the sound of the spoken word, 
What was it that motivated monks to begin composing lengthy discourses, writing them down and attributing them to the long dead Buddha, filling those discourses with exhortations from the Buddha to read, recite, and write down his words? Finally, what exactly is Buddha's Tantra, and when and why did it begin? All manner of theories are put forth. None is very satisfying, as we continue to cringe at the thought that the Victorian characterization of Tantra as being all about sex and magic might be right. <laughs> Yet, why do we cringe? It is because what has been Buddhist study's greatest asset is also its greatest liability. This is the conceit found somewhere in the psyche of so many scholars of Buddhism that Buddhism is the best religion. That is, it's such a good religion, it might not be a religion at all. I've traced the origins of this fantasy in a number of works, and again, it's too long of a story to tell here. That fantasy is an asset because it draws students into our classrooms, and as it has inspired so many of us to become scholars of Buddhism. It's a liability because it has caused an overvaluation and an unconscious mimicry of the Buddhist tradition, a tradition that is so deeply conservative, where it is a violation of the Bodhisattva vows to say that the Mahayana Sutras are not the word of the Buddha, where the most damning comment that a Buddhist author can make against another is to accuse him of innovation. This conservatism is not unique to Buddhism. We read almost daily about another attack on a scholar of Hinduism. We recall the firestorm of controversy that erupted when David Strauss published The Life of, the Buddha, sorry, the Life of Jesus Critically Examined in 1835. Yet our fantasy about Buddhism somehow causes us to imagine that it is somehow immune from such controversies. We need only note, however, that in the 180 years since the publication of Strauss's work, no life of the Buddha critically examined has appeared. There's no propaganda fide to prevent such a work from being written. There's no right-wing Buddhist state poised to attack its author. There is instead something more subtle, perhaps more per pernicious, an army of converts each a devotee of this or that monk or lama who claims, as all Buddhist monks and lamas do, to derive his authority from an unbroken lineage, lineage of transmission that can be traced back to the Buddha himself. Especially in the Tibetan tradition, many of these converts have become skilled translators of Buddhist works, producing translations of the works of their lamas' previous incarnations, claiming an authority that the scholar, who's not also a practitioner, Practitioner, a term that does not have an immediate analog in a Buddhist language, cannot possess. When the, when the history of the early 21st century, when the history of early 20th century American Buddhism is written, the chapter on the politics of translation should prove fascinating reading. Let me close with a quotation from Mark Twain. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a long passage from chapter nine of Life of the Mississippi. Life on the Mississippi, and here he describes the great river. The face of the water in time became a wonderful book, a book that was a dead language to the uneducated passenger, but which told its mind to me without reserve, delivering its most cherished secrets as clearly as if it had been uttered, as if it had uttered them with a voice. There never was so wonderful a book written by man, never one whose interest was so absorbing, so unflagging, so sparkling, sparklingly renewed with each reperusal. The passenger who could not read, who could not read it, was charmed with a particular, peculiar sort of faint dimple on its surface on the rare occasions when he did not overlook it entirely. But to the pilot, that was an italicized passage. Indeed, it was more than that. It was a legend of the largest capitals with a string of shouting exclamation points at the end of it, for it meant that a wreck or a rock was buried there that could tear the life out of the strongest vessel that ever floated. It is the faintest and simplest expression that the water ever makes, and the most hideous to a pilot's eye. In truth, the passenger who could not read this book saw nothing but all manner of pretty pictures in it, painted by the sun and shaded by the clouds, whereas to the trained eye, these were not pictures at all, but the grimmest and most dead earnest of reading matter. Now, when I had mastered the language of this water and had come to know every trifling feature that bordered the great river as familiarly as I knew the letters of the alphabet, 
I'd made a valuable acquisition. But I'd also lost something too. I'd lost something which could never be restored to me while I lived. All the grace, the beauty, the poetry had gone out of the majestic river. I still keep in mind a certain wonderful sunset which I witnessed when steamboating was new to me. I stood like one bewitched, I drank it in, in a speechless rapture. The world was new to me, and I'd never seen anything like this at home. But as I've said, a day came when I began to cease from noting the glories and the charms when the moon and sun and the twilight brought up, that the moon and sun and twilight brought upon the river's face. Another day came when I ceased altogether even to note them. Then, if that sunset scene had been repeated, I should have looked upon it without rapture and should have commented upon it inwardly after this fashion. This sun means that we're going to have wind tomorrow. That floating log means that the river's rising. No, the romance and the beauty that were, were all gone from the river, all the value any feature of it had for me now was the amount of usefulness it could furnish toward compassing the safe piloting of a steamboat. Since those days, I've pitied doctors from my heart. What does the lovely flush in a beauty's cheek mean to a doctor but a break that ripples above some deadly disease? Are not all visible charms sown thick with what are to him the signs and symbols of hidden decay? Does he ever see her beauty at all, or doesn't he simply view her professionally and comment upon her unwholesome condition all to himself? And doesn't he sometimes wonder whether he has gained most or lost most by learning his trade? One might read this passage as a call for what Paul Ricoeur called the second naivete. However, I would argue that there is both great meaning and what Quain calls romance and beauty to be found in our work as academic steamboat pilots navigating the rivers of our texts. When we, when we consider a religious text to be of divine origin, whether it be a book of the Bible or a Buddhist sutra, we greatly delimit the thoughts that we can think about it. For example, there are many Buddhists today who consider the Lotus Sutra to be the word of the Buddha. That is, that the Lotus Sutra was spoken by the historical Buddha. Like most scholars of Buddhism, I do not. That does not, to my mind, in any way demean or diminish the text. In many ways, it exalts it. For I see the Lotus Sutra a work of such extravagant wonder and of such yearning plea, not as the product of a mind of confident omniscience and of calm equanimity, long liberated from the mundane, but as the product of the mind that is human, all too human dreaming of, yet far from reaching that state in which the dense passions of the human have been forever destroyed. But that's just my opinion, and I wonder what someone will, else will say when the Department of Religion at FSU celebrates its centennial. Thank you very much.